Good afternoon and happy Thursday. I am Stacey Thompson, the Special Events Coordinator and Account Executive here at the Business Record. Thank you for joining us for our final Fearless Focus in our three-part virtual series. And if this is the first time that you're joining us, we're really glad that you're here. And for those of you who I know have marked this on your calendar um, each month, um, thank you for supporting our Fearless brand. So, so far in our Fearless series, we have covered leadership and confidence. And today we will hear from three incredible woman, women uh, sharing their stories of risk-taking and failure. When we launched the Fearless brand at the end of 2020, we knew that in addition to a weekly e-newsletter and other content, we wanted to have a space for conversation and connection. And our Fearless Focus virtual event series was born, providing that opportunity for anyone around the state and beyond to easily join the conversation. We have seen tremendous growth in our Fearless followers over the last two years. So we know these conversations have been powerful and resonated with many. And because of this, we are always looking for new ways to connect our audience. So we are excited to invite you all to join us in November for our first in-person Fearless event, which you'll hear more about later. But before we get to the conversation, I would like to introduce Susanna DeBaca, President and CEO of Business Publications, to welcome today's Fearless sponsor. Susanna? Hello, everybody, and thank you so much, Stacy. Welcome. Everybody, we're so glad you could join us here for Fearless. And before we start um, uh, with our panel and with the conversations, I am very pleased to be able to introduce and thank our sponsor, which is Girl Scouts of Greater Iowa. So you may know that Girl Scouts of Greater Iowa is a local nonprofit that encompasses 67 counties in central and western Iowa one county in Northeast Nebraska and two counties in Southeast South Dakota. The organization works to build girls of courage, confidence and character who make the world a better place. So what could be more appropriate for Fearless? I'm equally pleased to be able to introduce the CEO of that organization, Beth Sheldon. Beth embodies fearlessness and authenticity. She is a CEO, she's a speaker, a writer, an advocate, and a learner. And she even recently contributed to my leading fearless, fearlessly column in Fearless on the topic of microaggressions. And I had someone give me feedback that that column and Beth and others' words helped them to take action. That's what Beth is all about, turning courage into action. So please join me in welcoming Beth Shelton. Beth? Thank you so much for that warm introduction. I'm going to keep it brief this morning. I know we're all excited to get to the panel. I just want to say, you know, as a local nonprofit, we, of course, are very discerning about how we can use our resources wisely, which is actually in the Girl Scout Promise and Law, and who, you know, what we choose to sponsor. And I can think of no better outlet than organizations um, like the Fearless um, series, and that is really helping promote uh, equality and making a space for girls and women. Um, that's exactly what Girl Scouts stands for. Our very mission is building girls of courage, confidence, and character. So there's really no better fit. When I think about risk taking, you know, that's something that um, it it's been a journey for me in life. And I see that journey play out over and over with the people that I know and the people that I love from my peers and colleagues to the people in the community that I admire. And now I really try to think, you know, if I could give my daughters one tool to help them have better life outcomes. It's like, how can I get them to embrace that idea that taking risk is okay and it's bold and it leads to, to, to better outcomes for themselves and for the world. And that's so much of what Girl Scout stands for. We serve about 14,000 members here locally and the data is really clear. So we see almost no difference at age seven um, and we have a lot of research around this, about risk taking and sense of self and seeking challenges at age seven for females. And by age eight, we start to see a gap wider and wider and wider in terms of girls when they uh, are surveyed and how they identify um, is as having a strong sense of self and do they seek challenges. Um, Girl Scouts start to um, 
say yes at a much higher rate than non-Girl Scouts. And so there was just, there's compelling information about the way we can put girls in situations to push that, push themselves a little further past their comfort zone and create that resilience and grit. And then the disparity gets larger and larger. It doesn't get smaller and smaller. So the older females get, the larger that disparity in terms of sense of self, who has a supportive infrastructure like Girl Scouts and who doesn't, and then who seeks challenges. We know by age 18, girls who are in Girl Scouts seek challenges, uh, 62% say they seek challenges. Girls who are not in Girl Scouts, 42%. There's a huge difference. And we think about the women we're gonna hear today, what they accomplished, what they faced. Um, it's really getting that, getting that, that those tools, those resources on how we can best face those challenges. We all want to be around and hire people that are willing to face challenges, seek challenges, take those risks, change the world and have that grit. And we know that we don't, no one can hand us grit and resilience. We have to sort of earn it one hardship at a time. And what Girl Scouts does is help create really safe environments to push girls a little bit further past their comfort zone to give them that grit. So we're excited to sponsor an event like this um, because we know that we are building that future pipeline of the women who will be leading these panels in the next generation. And thank you for having us today. I'm excited to hear what everyone has to say. Thank you, Beth. It is fun to see you lead the charge here in Iowa with young women. So thank you for all that you do and for supporting Fearless. Um, and if anyone was curious, Girl Scout ski season starts in 118 days. So in addition to our November event, you might mark your calendar for that also. Um, and now we will move on in our program and get things started with business record editor, Emily Barsky. Thank you, Stacy, And hello, everyone. Uh, as has been mentioned, our goal with Fearless is to empower Iowa women to succeed in work and life. And to do that, we really believe in the power of inspiration and connection. So our topics today of risk-taking risk and overcoming failure are a key part of our core values. Through our Fearless events and our content, we've been really inspired by folks telling us about times they've taken risks. And by the way, those risks can be something that's small or, or momentous in however you look at them. We've also been encouraged by speakers and sources in our stories who have been willing to be vulnerable with us, telling us about their fears, their challenges, and times where they failed. In sharing these stories, we hope it gives you all a sense of community, knowing that we all have individual experiences, but we don't have to navigate them alone because we have support from others and we can learn from others. Today, we're talking about having the courage to take risks, and we hope that you'll see that if that scares you, and I'm sure it does to some extent, that you're not alone, but you have what you need to go out and do it. To start us off in the spirit of fearlessness, um, we've asked each of today's speakers to spend a few minutes sharing a story uh, about being fearless as it relates to risk-taking or failure. And we'd love if you would drop your own moments in the chat so that we can um, see what you all have experienced as well. And after we hear a story from each of the speakers, we're gonna ask them some questions. Fearless editor, Emily Kestel is co-moderating with me today. Emily is the engine behind Fearless and produces our weekly e-newsletter and print features. She recently wrote about her own experience with fearlessness, um, and I think she's going to drop that in the chat, so I hope that you'll check that out. So with us today, we have a great lineup that's going to inspire us. We have Kirsten Anderson, an author and advocate, and her book was published earlier this week. We just talked about that before. It sounds like that was successful, so everyone will have to check it out. Uh, Katie Hoff is also with us, and she is the team leader of cybersecurity operations at Walmart Blue Cross Blue Shield, and Connie Weimer, our chairman at BPC. Uh, and so we're going to ask each of them to start off with their story. So Kirsten, I'll go to you first. Thanks, Emily. It's good to see everybody's face on this call today. Um, I'm going to start with just a little bit background introduction and the risk that I took. And that was in 2013, I made a choice and took a really big risk and decided to speak up and out about the toxic workplace that I experienced uh, for just over five years at the Iowa State House and the sexual harassment that I experienced and, and witnessed uh, on an ongoing basis. I filed a formal complaint uh, against my employer uh, and subsequently, I was fired seven hours later. That was the result of me taking that risk. 
that set me on a journey, uh, an emotional journey, a legal journey, a personal journey that brings me to you today. Uh, I wrote that book that came out on Tuesday that Emily mentioned. And um, I'm really happy to share my lessons learned and everything in between about taking risks and um, what becomes of those risks. Uh, and uh, Katie, we'll go to you. Thank you for having me today. And this outcome and the whole concept is amazing. And I'll share with you um, my story of how I signed up to join the military and was rejected twice um, on that. So did you want me to share that one now or are we waiting? Go ahead, okay. So I had wanted to join since I was middle school, high school. Uh, it had always been in the back of my mind. So when I turned 18, I went ahead and started the process. And my dad's a Navy veteran, and he had two strong recommendations for his youngest daughter. One, go Navy, go Air Force. And two, if you can, go in as an officer. So I went and talked to the Air Guard. I filled out all the paperwork. I started their three-hour aptitude test, seeing if I could calculate diameter, how my spelling was, all of that. I did the physical. And I mean, the physical is not just about your height, your weight, your vision, but it was how did your joints work? And I was a little bit unprepared for that because we had to strip down to our underwear and basically walk across the room. The doctors were seeing if we were flat-footed, how our balance was, et cetera. And at the end of all this, you get your results. And I had failed because I have bad eyesight and I didn't meet their weight requirements. So I was a little disheartened for, for a while, but being a teenager, um, bounced back quickly. I was about to start nursing school at Mercy College of Health Sciences, and I figured that would be an adventure in itself. Um, fast forward 12 to 13 years later, I just finished my college degree. Um, it was in management information systems, completely different. I changed my major three to four times, went to about four different colleges. Um, and I had this random thought in my head, college degree, go in as an officer. One of dad's strong requirements. So I started researching and looking at officer candidate school and how it works. And I had this internal debate in my head as to, should I, is this a good idea? Can I do this? Why not? And this is kind of how my brain works. I mean, it took me two weeks to go buy a $20 purse at Target. And I'm pretty sure I went back to the store about five times to, to look at this purse to see, should I or not? So, you know, joining the military was a big deal. I went ahead and talked to the Navy recruiter. Um, I took the aptitude test again. Yep, still know how to use pi, still know how to spell. And I was referred to the officer's recruiter. And I talked to him and his assistant on a daily basis. We were becoming best friends. Uh, I gathered my transcripts, my resume, wrote a letter as to why I would be good for this role, submitted my background check. I even had disclosed my one speeding ticket and, and went on from there. I had full support from my husband, which was extremely important because we had two kids under the age of five at, at that time. And so we discussed the length of time I'd be away. It was 10 weeks for basic plus another five weeks for the school plus OCS was more sporadic, but it was a pretty big commitment, not just for me, but also for my whole family. And then we also talked about you know, life and military, his job position, moving, and all of that. I completed the physical, which this time there were no concerns, um, and I scheduled three panel interviews in Omaha. The night before I was supposed to drive up to Omaha, I got a phone call from the recruiter telling me that my interviews had been canceled because my resume wasn't competitive enough and they wouldn't even consider me. Um, this was a little bit more upsetting just because I created all these big plans in my head and, you know, what we were going to do, how, how this was going to work out. We put a lot of time and effort into, into this whole process. I mean, I even told my neighbors, hey, the FBI might be stopping by asking you questions about me. Like, is she a good person? Um, that type of thing. So I was, I was ready to go and the family was on board. 
and it's hard to be told that you're not good enough or you're not competitive enough, especially when you put all that effort into it. Um, so that was that was very distressing at the time. But after a while, I decided that, yes, I can be competitive enough. And so I went and I pursued my master's degree. And, and with that, that pushed me to a, a job that I really enjoy. It introduced me to a field that I love. And I was able to job shadow and get enough experience under my belt to be able to move into the role that I'm in today. So I kind of see that failure as as being able to open new doors and see, see where it can lead you. Awesome, thank you. And Connie, your story. Okay, well, I've taken a lot of risks and um, have gotten to the point I really enjoy it. I love that uh, quote you printed recently, uh, do something terrifying each day. And um, I can't quite qualify for terrifying each day, but I do uh, really enjoy taking risks. I'm going to share the story of the time that I was most frightened uh, for, the, for the future. And uh, that was when I had purchased a, a small company that printed a, uh, a, a legal paper, four pages, uh, five days a week, called the Des Moines Daily Record. And I purchased it to gain control of the information and the timing. Uh, at the time, I owned a title company. So uh, I purchased it to uh, speed up the process and take advantage of um, the computer I had recently purchased. I purchased it on a 20-year contract, both, both companies. And I'll tell you, signing <laughs> that contract for 20 years is, uh, is a, a frightening experience. But anyway, a year and a half after I had purchased it, the judges decided they didn't need an official legal paper anymore. And they gave me five days notice. And uh, I literally, at the end of five days, had no product, no revenue, but I still owed 18 and a half years on that contract. Well, I was truly, um, truly frightened. And at the time I said, someday I'll thank those judges. And uh, indeed it, it has evolved to that, that point because I would never have um, probably taken the risks that I did had they not forced me to do that. And, um, so I uh, determined that I was going to create a, a successful product that would eventually pay off that contract, I created the business record. And I had no knowledge or training of publishing whatsoever. And so I made every mistake in the book. But I learned day by day. And uh, now, 39 years later, we're about to um, have a, a 40th anniversary next year. Thank you all so much for sharing a bit about your backgrounds and, and your stories with taking a risk. Um, I want to ask you all um, this question to start us off. Um, what gives you courage to take risks? And Kirsten, I'll start with you. What gives me the courage to take risks is the, well, two things. My support system is is there behind me, has been behind me, and I can I know that nothing is more important than them. And so anything I do, no matter what happens, they've got my back. And that also contributes to the confidence that I've, I've built up. And when I shared a little bit about my story, um, so be, being a, a target of sexual harassment and being the butt of people's jokes for years upon years upon years, you start to believe the bad things that are said about you. And you get to a point where you are so emotionally low that you don't even recognize who you are anymore. So my self-confidence was extremely low at the time when I spoke up and out against my employer and then they fired me. So you can imagine I was even lower at the time. And 
having been through that experience, learning who I can lean on, how I can lean on them, and going on this journey through uh, suing my employer, winning the lawsuit, writing a book, all these things contributed to building back my self-worth and my self-confidence. And it's to a point now, and let's face it, I'm I'm getting up there in age and I've had enough life experiences where I, I, I know myself really well. And having taken those risks, I can easily say, oh, I, I, I have enough confidence left in me now that I can bounce back from anything, no matter what the decision is. Yeah, thank you. I'll have a follow-up question to that, but I want to go to you, Katie. Uh, what gives you courage to take risks? I like finding the the end of it and not just finding the end goal and and that, but how we get there. So I'm I'm type of person that will actually read the end of a book, but then or watch the end of a movie, but I like watching how it all plays out or how they get to that point. Um, in addition to that, having the support system, being able to lean on people, um, like I mentioned, my husband was a great support when I said, I want to join the Navy and I'm going to be gone for months at a time. Good luck with the kids. And just knowing that he's, he had that and being helpful and family support and just having the connections with people. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Connie, I'll go to you next. What gives you the courage to take risks? Well, my motivation for risk taking has changed over the years. My probably second biggest risk was um, buying Iowa Title Company. Uh, again, a company that was losing money and um, <clears throat> that uh, had a lot of negative things about it. And I didn't know anything about the title business. But my motivation at that time was to, to be able to afford a company that would could be a turnaround and that I could send my three daughters to college. And it, it was strictly a money thing when I made the original decision. I was just determined they would each have a college degree. And uh, as time has, has gone on, um, I, as I said in my first statement, I, I really enjoy taking a calculated risk now. I look look forward to them. And as I answered your question earlier in the week, um, I, I think taking risks is like a muscle and uh, the more you use it, the stronger it gets and um, the more comfortable you are using it. And it gets to the point that it just becomes a, another decision that you're making as opposed to looking at it as a real risk. So Connie, I'm curious, um, you talk about building up your risk muscle. What are some, what are some risks that you can take every day or some smaller, um, acts of fearlessness that you can, that you can do every day to build up that muscle? Oh gosh. When you're involved in the business world, you, you have all sorts of opportunities to, to take risks and, um, you know, you do it in your personal life. You make decisions that um, not everyone would would be comfortable making. Um, I remember uh, learning how to do public speaking, and like anything else, it takes practice. And risk taking takes practice to get comfortable with it. Yeah, uh, Katie, in your comments, you had said kind of um, moving from thinking about like fear of the unknown to seeing the unknown as an opportunity. Um, I guess, how did you, how did you change that mindset? How do you go from being too afraid to uh, enter into the unknown to rather seeing it as that opportunity? I think after time, you're kind of, you kind of move past the, well, what's going to happen. And if you, when I look back on things, I see, I didn't know how this would end, it ended well, or, or taking a failure or something that didn't end well and being able to turn it into something positive and, and knowing that outcome. I mean, you're gonna have your, your ups and your downs, your pluses, your minuses with it. So you kind of have to change of, okay, this is scary, what's gonna happen to, 
we'll see how this goes. Yeah. Uh, Kirsten, before I go to you, I just want to remind everyone that if you have questions for the panelists, uh, feel free to drop those in the chat. We'll try to get to them. Um, but Kirsten, you, um, you, your lawsuit went on for years and you and I have talked about how it took a long time for you to get back to who you are today, um, and building back up that self-confidence. Um, when did you, when did you start recognizing, uh, that you are a confident woman again and what, what steps or like, what things did you do to kind of build that back up? It was well, similar to what Connie said, it was flexing that muscle and finding different ways. I mean, I, I really did work on it. When I was first fired, I went through what I felt was similar to the stages of grief. Um, and each day I, I made incremental, you know, choices to do something more. You know, one day it was just the choice. I need to take a risk and just get out of bed today. Um, and, and I built that up to, okay. I'm going to start writing because writing is therapeutic for me. And I've always been a journaler and okay, I'm, I'm going to keep writing and okay. You know, incrementally, I, I really had to just work up to it and okay, I'm going to share my writing with someone. I'm going to take a risk and put that out into the world. So these little things and, um, to Katie's point, the, the unknown, I, I think about, well, what's the worst that could happen? I always ask myself and that helps me flex that muscle. And well, if I take this risk, what's the worst that could happen to me? One of the things as I hear you all reflecting is that I, I know it can be easier when things are in the past to reflect on it and realize, you know, this this was actually a good thing or or no, see the positive in something or, or the lesson in something, but it's maybe a bit harder to do that in the moment when you're uh, going through something. So I'm curious to know from you all, what are some tactics that you have for being able to take those steps in overcoming um, fear or overcoming failure that initially that can be when you feel just, you know, crummy about it. Uh, and Katie, I'll start with you. I think at the moment in time, you just kind of, you don't want to do anything. You're just, oh my gosh, this, this stinks. It's horrible. And you really don't know, know what's next. And it's, it's as the other two ladies have said, it's the small steps that you have to do. It's the small things that you just keep pushing forward. Um, as Kirsten said, getting out of bed, some days it's like, okay, I got to do this. And you just have to, you have to go because you have to just keep living them. As, as crazy as that sounds, you just have to, it's small things. And the insight eventually comes to you. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Connie, what would you say? Well, you know, when you're just starting to take risks, if you haven't done it very much, uh, you should do a lot of preparation. And to me, that means talking to people that think differently than you do. But whatever it might be, particularly if it's in business, do a, a tremendous amount of research so that you go into knowing what the risks actually are. And um, one of my mottos is prepare for the worst that could possibly happen, but expect the best. Because I think we often get those things that we expect to get. And I think that optimism of uh, expectation is, is equally as important as that preparation for if the bottom falls out. Kirsten? I, lo I love what Connie just said. I mean, what I, what I will simply add, because both Connie and Katie said perfect things, but don't let the, the risk and decision-making paralyze you because it can, it can. And so don't get, don't get caught up in the what ifs and know, and I'll simply say, be reassured that no matter what risk you take or that, that you're facing, um, we as humans have choice in, in our lives. And if you take a risk, make a choice and it, and it goes badly, make another choice to 
take the lessons from it and take another risk and decide the other way tomorrow. Kristen, I always say that um, failure is just another form of learning, that you, you learn something from it that's very valuable and um, make the changes to uh, adapt and move on. I want to ask you all about a theme that Beth brought up in her sponsor remarks, but uh, there's a large body of research that shows that boys and men are often more risk averse than, than girls and women. And a lot of that is because of barriers in society, social conditioning. So I'd like to know from each of you, what, what can we do to change that environment to make it so that girls and women feel more comfortable taking risks just as boys and men do? Honey, I can start with you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I think um, the statement by uh, Beth about what the Girl Scouts do is one very important thing because the earlier start, um, the, the stronger the young woman will be. But um, <clears throat> uh, there's a leadership group for young women at Morningside College, and uh, I uh, ask them to, to be sure to include two topics, um, one, negotiation skills, and two, risk-taking. And um, the young women that have graduated from that program have um, been talking about what was most valuable. Those were the things that they were valuing most in their everyday life. And Katie, what would you say? Well, for starters, I'd say disconnect from social media. Um, younger generations, especially females, they'll post something on their Instagram, their Facebook, whatever it is, and then they'll go back and check to see who liked it, who hearted this. Go get away from that and go out and develop real world relationships, find mentors, find peers, build that support group, and just get away from the people that, oh, you know, this is the perfect pose, you look so great, because they're not necessarily necessarily going to be there during your lows or your downfalls, whereas if you're building your support system and you're finding people that will take the time to help guide you, they will be there and they will be the ones to, to help you through your risks and your failures and your successes. Kirsten, what do you think? I'd simply add, I think we need to continue to encourage and um, provide practical application in that, um, encourage young women to, to take these risks non, in a non-judgmental way and um, back that up with helping them navigate the back end of, uh, or fall out or whatever happens with that risk they take. Um, it will help them flex that that muscle that we've talked about. It looks like Allison just dropped a question in the chat, um, and she said that she'd love to um, hear more from the speakers about um, what we can say to young women who are just getting started in the workforce. Um, she said, my own personal experiences with taking risks came from getting older and learning to navigate the worst case scenarios, similar to what Kirsten said, but how do we help encourage those who don't have those years of experiences yet under their belt? One of the things that I did when I was um, terribly um, unself-confident uh, when I bought my title company was to um, form along with three other women uh, a breakfast club. There were no women's breakfast clubs in those days. Lots of men's, but none for women. And we surrounded ourselves with people that knew things different. They had different knowledge base than, than I did, certainly. But I was totally trusting and comfortable with them. That has now grown to 70 women, and it's called Nexus, and uh, has been around for 50 years, I think, now. So I'm always encouraging younger women to, uh, to do that. There's just a power in um, having that, that total freedom to 
ask questions and not worry about sounding dumb. So if you don't have a women's group, form one is my advice. And that have you know similar needs and wants that as you do. Yeah, that's a good piece of advice. Kirsten, do you have anything to say to Allison's question? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad she brought up the new to the workforce, that category of employees and that in, in my advocacy work to create harassment free workplaces, this is something that I feel very strongly about because we don't talk about harassment and, you know, workplace politics. It's not taught in school, right? So young workers, they're navigating all different things in the workplace. And I, I would just say, and this is what I try to do, have a conversation, find out who your allies are, get a mentor, create those connections. Just like Connie said, create those groups. Um, if, if you don't find them, do it yourself, make it happen. Um, that will help flex that muscle, that confidence muscle and, and help with everything in navigating the workplace. Person. Yeah, if you had had a small group of women that you could really talk openly about during those five years you went through that, it probably would have been a little bit easier and maybe you would have taken those bold steps a little earlier. Absolutely. It would, <laughs> the outcome may have been very different. Mm -hmm. Katie, did you have anything that you wanted to add with Allison's question? I think from the perspective of being in leadership or management, it is also up to us to create that safe space or that place where women can fail. And if not the female in the management position, then find the males that can. My leader has always been very supportive, has always created a safe space. Being able to find, as, as Kirsten and Connie said, your allies and your support group but it's up to us women that are in that position to do that job too. This is a, a similar um, topic, in, but it re related. Uh, I, I know there's also studies that have shown that men are more likely to apply for a position that they're not necessarily fully qualified for than, than women are. And um, so what can we do to make sure that women Put themselves out there that they apply for those positions and and strive to get promoted again i think um <clears throat> the comfort level with negotiations is a huge help in in that regard and you know again the only way you get comfortable is by practicing which is painful but um <clears throat> you know uh I probably had um, 20 different types of, totally different types of, of jobs over the years, and most of them without any specific training or experience in, in the field. And um, just doing those, those things because other people believed in me gave me enough confidence that I could move on and, and take the risk. Uh, that that I have in my particular in my business life. Katie, what do you think? I think with lots of encouragement, we can get women to feel more confident that they can they can do the job and just guiding them through it. Mm -hmm. Kirsten, is there anything that you think would help? Um, help you if you think back to your younger self um, in, in thinking of seeking something out that you may not have considered? Um, just, well, thinking about my self-worth and I don't, I, I always went about things when I was younger in a way that I, I should have valued myself a little bit more. I was, I should have asked for more raises. I, I should have, th that type of thing. Um, instead, I just 
I, I had the opposite effect. It, I was lucky to have a job. I never asked for, for raises, um, but I asked for more work, um, thinking that, that my deeds would prove that I was worthy of simply receiving a pay raise. So um, I wish someone would have helped guide me through that sort of thing. It was more of like a first job type experience that I wish I would have had an ally or a mentor to talk to about. And, you know, Emily, I don't mean to change the topic from, from risk taking to negotiation, but negotiations really are risky. And, you know, um, uh, the, the thing I say to young women nowadays is that for some reason, females tend to feel that there's something bad about negotiating. And uh, I tell them that in a good negotiation, both parties get something they would not have gotten otherwise. You don't have to have a winner and a loser. You can have two winners that, that both gain from a negotiation. And just to tell you a quick story, uh, when I owned uh, Iowa Title and then after I sold it, I stayed on for many, many years. I was there 25 years. And, hired a lot of different people over that period of time. Almost every single male that I made an offer to negotiated the starting salary, not one female ever did. 25 years. I mean, that's, that's huge. And we have to teach young women that negotiating when, when everybody is, um, is being um, forthright and, um, and, and looking for that happy place for, for both parties, uh, everybody wins. And, and to be taught in schools at a very early age. Yeah. Katie, you had talked about um, the importance of creating those spaces where people can fail. Um, and Chris just dropped a question in the chat that said, uh, what advice would you give to men who want to help and provide an environment that makes it easier for women to take risks. Um, so I'll let you ask, uh, answer that one first. I would advise men to, to step up. Um, firstly, to call out inappropriate things. Um, a story, quick story behind that, I was in a meeting and I was the only female there. And one of the guys there you know, turned and looked at me, he's like, how's it feel being the only one? And I just kind of looked at him like, the only one what? And he got a little awkward about it. And like, the only person from security here. Like, yeah, that's not where you're going. But you know, in a t with the table of other, other men there, any one of them could have called that out also. Um, so I would just encourage them to step up, call that out. And then going back to the mentorship, even if you're, even if you're male, you know, it's totally acceptable and great if you're mentoring a female and also providing that safe space for them. Yeah, Kirsten, uh, what advice would you give? We need more men to encourage other men to be mentors and allies. We need them stepping up. Um, in, in my advocacy work, we've seen, I've seen the pendulum swing the other way that men are being and saying they're afraid to mentor women now, um, thanks in part to the Me Too movement. And I think that's a really crummy cop out. So I, I think in order to get back to that, we need other men encouraging each other that this is right and should happen, that it makes our workplaces and just our relationships better. And then Connie, what would your advice be? Uh, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, if you're the fa father of a young girl, um, make sure that from a very young age, you help her be independent and confident and um, recognize that she, she needs to exercise that, that risk muscle. And she needs to not just get comfortable with negotiating, but to get really good at it and to in, enjoy it. It's, uh, it's fun. I love negotiating. 
um, I think speaking up and, um, you know, for so long, the word feminist had a, a, a bad connotation in so many people's minds. And if you go to the dictionary, it's simply equality of males and, and females. And um, who can be against that? Well, I know there are some people who, who can be, but um, <clears throat> it's, it, 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 it's hard to publicly say men ought to have advantages that, that women don't have. So um, speaking up and uh, if, if you're in a large company, find a, a woman to mentor. Um, and, and teach and promote. Look for look for opportunities. That's a great question, Chris. Thank you. So I read a piece in the Wall Street Journal last month that kind of explored the notion that uh, we really don't like being bad at something. Um, and then China Wong last week in our 90 Ideas in 90 Minutes event talked about the importance of having a humility hobby. Um, so my question to you is, um, what are your thoughts on how perfectionism and um, a fear of failure or just a fear of simply not being good at something, how is, how is that affecting women today? And then do you have any advice for reaching that realization that you don't have to be good or great at everything that you do? Connie, I'll start with you. Okay. Um... Well, I, I took up tennis in my late 30s, and you can imagine I was, um, I was pretty awful. But I had some friends that were very good, and, and I wanted to play with them, so I just I kept after it. I'm thinking of pickleball right now. I keep hearing uh, about it as it, it, being great, great fun. I think athletics is a, a good place to, to do that. but. Um, Anything you do for the first time, it's not going to be done perfectly. And uh, whether it's athletics or <laughs> the first time I did Wordle, I thought, how in the world, with no, <laughs> with no hints or help of any kind, could you possibly find one word they're thinking of? And uh, uh, with a little coaching from one of my daughters, I uh, figured out how to do it. And those challenges, you know, I, again, I just did, um, I've never done crossword puzzles and uh, just did one on a, on a road trip that uh, I was kind of concerned that having not done them, I'd be really bad at it. And I, I found if you get into it, anything, you start picking up things. And whether you're great or medium or awful, if you have fun at it, good mental exercise. Yeah, Kirsten, I'll go to you next. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought this up. I, I think we, and when I say we, I, I, we as a culture and a society have an unhealthy relationship with perfection. And that is thanks in part to social media. And I think we need to get over trying to be perfect, just period, period. This is something I have, I have conversations with my 12 year old son about because, you know, at that age, seventh grade, he's, he's trying to do all the things and get, get good grades and be all these things. And that to me is he's trying to be perfect and that's unattainable. And we, everyone on this call is unique in some way, shape or form. And that's imperfection right there, that uniqueness. And imperfection will have, will lead to failures and that's okay. And I, I just think this, this unattainable notion of perfection leads to all these other negative and terrible damaging things. And I think we need to kick that to the curb and think differently about what it means to be good and do good things and, and be a unique human being. And then Katie, I'll go to you too. Uh, so Kirsten talked about her son who, you know, wanted to do things perfectly. And I can totally relate with my youngest. He plays baseball. And if he misses a ball, he gets so mad at himself. And it's like, dude, did you try? Did you put forth the effort? Well, yeah. Then who cares? You, you did what you needed to do. You're not going to be perfect about it. 
And going to what Connie said, I mean, I play slow pitch softball and I'm not very good, but I keep playing because for me, it's fun. And I know that I don't hit very well and it's slow pitch softball. So, I mean, I, I probably should, but at some point in time, you just say, yep, I'm just, I'm just here for fun and it's good. Kirsten, since you earlier mentioned that you like to do journaling, I'm curious if you have any good prompts or exercises that people can go through when they're thinking about overcoming perfectionism. Um, well, what I like to do, what is a prompt for me that I use again and again is I act like I'm writing a letter either to a person or maybe I'm writing a letter to my future self. Um, and, you know, I say something and just tuck it away. Right. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter what it says, but it it's in that moment, you're writing down your feelings and how you feel in that moment. And that I think helps you get over lots of stuff. Yeah, we are getting close to time, but I want to make sure that we have um, enough time for you all to squeeze in one last takeaway um, that you want to leave audience members with um, as they embark on the rest of their day. Um, Connie, I will go to you. What's the one thing you want people um, to take away from this conversation? Well, I'll go back to my passion of women helping women. And um, I... I very often close a, a speech or a presentation uh, challenging people every single day when you go to bed at night, think about what you did to help another woman. And it doesn't have to be huge. It could be uh, an introduction or um, <clears throat> an idea or just a, a very sincere compliment. Uh, but just try every single day to help another woman be happier or more successful. Katie, what would your one takeaway be? As women, we need to stop tearing each other down and be more supportive. As Connie said, helping each other out. There are a lot of women that will make comments towards other ones that it's kind of a, did you really, really need to say that? I mean, it's kind of a, a diss on your own gender. Be more supportive to each other. And then Kirsten. Katie, I'm going to piggyback off what you just said and in that refrain from judgment. And it's easy to make a judgment call about another woman, but you don't know their situation. So simply refrain from judgment and that, that will help everybody out. I love all of your thoughts. Thank you each for sharing your stories and sharing your ideas and thoughts with us today. Um, we also want to again thank our fearless sponsors and of course thank you to our audience for tuning in today. Uh, if you enjoyed this conversation we encourage you to join us for our in-person fearless celebration. It's being held Thursday November 17th from 10 a.m. to noon at the West Des Moines Sheraton and we'll be able to drop that uh, link in the chat for everyone. If you've got ideas or feedback on today's event please reach out to Emily Kestel. We are a locally owned and operated business and your support as a business record member or sponsor helps us continue to do work like this. Reach out to Chris Konetsky if you're interested in advertising and sponsorship opportunities. And finally, we wanna leave you with a call to action. Go out and take a risk today, even if you know you may fail. Maybe it's something small you put off because you didn't know how to do it. That's often what happens with me. Or maybe it's something big that you've been putting off because you've been waiting for the right time as if there ever is a right time. Now is your time. So whatever you choose, we hope you'll be fearless in your efforts to continue empowering Iowa women. And we hope you'll consider sharing what you decide to do by emailing Emily or me. Thank you for attending and we hope you have a great rest of your day.